Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar. Learn how to protect your infrastructure and property investments from one of today's costliest hazards. I'm your host, Kevin Jones, and also a co-presenter for the webinar. I'm currently serving as the Vice President of Product with Catalyst. I will be joined shortly by Sean Malamed, our Product Marketing Manager at Catalyst. Sean will be providing a live demonstration in this webinar. At Catalyst, we believe strongly in simplifying access to Earth data, and today I am pleased to present our solution for displacement monitoring as a service. A quick reminder that to ensure a great viewing experience, all lines are automatically muted and can only be unmuted by the presenters. Feel free to ask any questions throughout the session as we will be addressing them following the presentation. Early in 2021, a group of scientists sounded the alarm louder than ever regarding the global risk associated with land subsidence. These scientists who are part of the UNESCO Land Subsidence International Initiative published an article in Science Magazine based on their research. In their work, they highlighted areas in the world that are facing or could face potentially destructive hazards due to land subsidence, which is often triggered by solid or fluid mobilization underground. Changes in climate with an increasing population threaten to further put people and infrastructure at risk. Recognizing these risks, we at Catalyst have proactively processed Sentinel-1 archive imagery over susceptible areas along the eastern U.S. seaboard. More information will be provided on this by Sean in the live demonstration. Further to the work by UNESCO Land Subsidence International Initiative, scientists at the British Geological Survey have studied the impact of shrink swell, a process that's related to rapid changes in certain soils, including permafrost and clays, and found that climate change has increased the phenomenon. Shrink swell, which is a natural process that has been accelerating, can cause significant damage to critical infrastructure on an annual basis, as seen in this example. There are many other types of infrastructures at risk. Hydroelectric dams or other types of dams, for example, embankment dams on mine sites, are experiencing a rise in frequency and severity of flooding, these events can overwhelm a dam's design limits and accelerated aging. Furthermore, monitoring ground subsidence can identify foundation defects, including settlement and slope instability. Many different types of infrastructures are at risk, including airports, buildings, bridges, roads, and railroads. These examples taken from recent events over the last years highlight the cost to property, infrastructure, lost productivity, and in many cases, human lives. The Oroville Dam spillway failure in 2017 was triggered by heavy rain. The integrity of the dam, one of the tallest structures of the US at 235 meters, is a continuing key concern. Several airports around the world built on reclaimed land could cause significant disruption in the movement of goods and people if they were to experience failures. Lastly, damage to personal property, including residential housing and industrial buildings, has been on the rise in many parts of the world, in part due to subsidence caused by shrink swell, as mentioned, and also other factors such as seismic activity and abandoned underground mining operations. At Catalyst, we have developed a near real-time monitoring service that's based on satellite imagery that makes the information available to business users so that they can make better decisions, better risk and investment decisions regarding critical infrastructure, safety ratings, loan portfolios, and many other issues as previously highlighted. In this example, satellite-based monitoring can provide information about the dam structure as well as the surrounding area. The displacement data can be analyzed to trigger alerts once exceeding client-defined thresholds. Some of the features of the service that we offer include millimeter to centimeter level measurements, large coverage 
in terms of the area. Monitor pretty much anywhere in the world where the data is collected, which is most land areas. High density of measurements in terms of the spatial coverage of the measurements. The regular updating in terms of uh, rapid revisit or routine revisit of the data. And in addition, there is decades of historical data available to look at trends in the past as an indication of what might happen in the future. We will now be providing a demonstration of the displacement data we have generated over some of the sample areas in the U.S. Eastern Seaboard. Catalyst is able to leverage our deep and rich science to extract displacement data using our automated cloud-based production capabilities. Insights provides API-based access to displacement and alert information. An intuitive web-based application can also be used to monitor and understand the context of the displacement data by combining it with other spatial layers, such as property parcel maps, roads, or other spatial data sets. Over to you, Sean. Thank you, Kevin. And once again, welcome everyone to this webinar. In this demonstration, I'm going to be showcasing uh, ground uh, displacement mapping using Catalyst Insights. We've stood up two uh, pre-processed cities already along the eastern seaboard. So we have Washington, D.C. and Atlantic City. The demonstration today I'm going to be focusing on is Washington, D.C. And we've used historical satellite uh, imagery, so SAR data, dating back as far as August 2015 for this monitoring uh, analytics. Now, we've specifically, we have a couple other cities that we're going to be launching soon along the eastern seaboard as well. And uh, the reason we selected the eastern seaboard of the United States is because of two main factors. So the first factor is because it exhibits a lot or it's at high risk of ground displacement due to a number of factors, including the geology and, and the climate in the area. Now, the other reason is because of the dense population and the amount of infrastructure and the and valuable assets in the area. So, so the combination of ground displacement with uh, dense populations and built up areas means that there's more features, infrastructure, buildings that are at risk of uh, damage due to displacement that can, in some cases, cause catastrophic failures and in many cases causes uh, costly downtime and repairs. So. With that, the city, once again, that we are really highlighting today is Washington, D.C. So this is, for obvious reasons, it's a politically significant uh, city within the United States as it's the capital of the country with a number of very recognizable and important uh, assets, infrastructure and monuments. And as you can see here by this UNESCO map, which is published by the United Nations, showcasing global uh, subsidence around uh, the world, basically has highlighted Washington, D.C. as a high-risk area, uh, particularly in the southern part of the city, but this also includes the surrounding areas as well. So in terms of our service offering, so when you uh, subscribe to an area of interest like Washington, D.C., you're then going to be uh, provided with access to ground displacement measurements throughout your area of interest. So First things first, how do we uh, interpret this? Well, when we're zoomed out like this, you're going to see a grid map where basically the white colors represent uh, where areas are stable and air colors that are green, cyan, blue represent areas that are uplifting or there is swelling occurring. Areas with red, yellow, orange are representing where are representative of uh, areas that have uh, ground displacement or sorry subsidence, so where the ground is actually sinking. Now, if we zoom out, I just want to showcase very quickly the scale in which we can monitor uh, using satellite uh, radar imagery. So as you can see, we've got a significant area of the greater Washington DC region where we're able to monitor. And if we just like quickly measure this here, we can see that uh, we have a cross sections of approximately 80 kilometers by, um, oops, let's just do that again quickly, 80 kilometers by uh, also about 80 kilometers. So it's a very large area that we're able to monitor. And then using the Sentinel-1 uh, sensor that we're using for the data collection or satellite that we're using for the data collection, we're able to get a new measurement approximately every 12 days. So 
Now, when we zoom into features, so the first one we're going to take a look at, and we've also identified a number of areas of interest here, so different features that uh, we saw potential risk or features of interest that uh, were of significant importance uh, within the area. So the first one we're going to take a look at is Ronald Reagan Airport. Now, Ronald Reagan Airport is a significant domestic airport that has about 23 million uh, visitors per year in a typical year. Now, what we can see in this airport is that overall, the runways, the taxiways, and the airport itself is quite stable. Um, however, in the southeast corner of this runway here, we can see that this bank um, is experiencing quite high ground subsidence where the ground is sinking. And this is right towards uh, this river system here. So if we look at this area, you can see that the area is sinking by as much as 11 millimeters per year. And it's sinking at different rates depending on where you are along this embankment. Now this can have uh, negative effects to the, the runway itself. It can put the runway at risk of, of damage. And, uh, and this can cause costly downtime and repairs for the runway itself. So the recommendation at this point would be that further investigation needs to be done in this area to make sure that it's secure and if necessary, potential take potentially take action to reinforce it. Now, some other areas of interest that we looked at. So we have this rail corridor here, which is in the southwest section of that same airport, Ronald Reagan Airport. So here's actually the end of the runway here, just to help, help you orientate yourself. So along this corridor, you can see that we have a noticeable pattern of, once again, uh, ground subsidence where the ground is sinking along this corridor. Uh, in some cases, it's sinking as high as five millimeters per year. And uh, this is another area that we just want to be able to monitor as it provides a critical service and any kinds of damage like uh, soil slip or other types of um, subsidence can cause damage in the cracks or in the tracks. And then this can cause downtime repairs and, you know, and, and really bad situations can cause failures. So this is just another area in which we can um, actively see and monitor where there's potential risk and, and further investigation is required. Now, going over to another area here, we're going to look at a different type of displacement. So this is the opposite. So in this case, we're actually looking at uh, ground uplift or ground swelling where the ground is actually rising in elevation. So in this case, we can see here that around this uh, interchange, this highway interchange, we have um, ground displacement that's being measured as high as four millimeters per year. Now, this could be natural swell that occurs but it could also be uh, unnatural swell due to a variety of factors such as a shrink swell and, and a number of different um, geological uh, um, uh, phenomenon or geohazardous phenomenon. And this can put these uh, this infrastructure, these bridges at risk, uh, once again, damage and failure. So this is just another area that warrants some further investigation to make sure that, uh, that the structures are not in, uh, that they're not at risk of, of potential damage due to the ground displacement. Now, there's a number of other areas of interest that we've identified. We're not going to go through them all here. Once again, I've mentioned this is an interactive demonstration that we've made available on our website, so you can you can go in and log into this and uh, view it yourself uh, on your own time. But I feel like no visit to Washington, D.C. is exactly complete without at least visiting some key features. So the first one uh, we're going to take a look at is, of course, the White House. So uh, in this case, thank goodness there is no ground displacement in the area. The structure is quite sound um, and stable, as you can see here. So uh, that's an important. Uh, and, this, and this is generally what we want to see is when you're monitoring your assets or, or, uh, or your client's assets, is you want to see that the area is stable around it. Otherwise, there's uh, potential risk and action that's required. So it's important to be monitoring this. And the nice thing is we get measurements on a regular basis. basis. So new measurements come in, for example, every 12 days with the Sentinel-1 sensor, but it can be even more frequent with different sensors. And we can get alerts when measurements or when there is all of a sudden a potential problem. And the final place we're going to take a, a peek at within Washington, D.C. is the Pentagon here. So once again, 
overall, the Pentagon is very stable, as you would expect. It's a very important feature. And uh, and really, there's there's no real reason for concern. We are seeing some very isolated cases of uh, where there might be some ground displacement. There's some clustering over here, which might be a reason to just take a, a further investigation on just this area of the building. But overall, I would say that this uh, that the Pentagon is, is quite uh, structurally sound, or at least is not facing uh, ground displacement uh, uh, risk. So. When you log in and, and subscribe to our area, so once again, this is a demonstration that we're making uh, freely available on our website. So it does have limited functionality uh, as it is a demonstration. So when you do subscribe to your own area of interest that you want to monitor, uh, you get access to number one, you get access to more tools. I'm just going to pull this up here so you get access to more tools so you get uh, timelines you get to see profiles you can see time series so you can see how the movement changes over time and there's a number of additional tools for analysis that you can access uh, when you subscribe we also have an api so a restful api that's supported through aws's data exchange so you can go and also programmatically um, have the data or access the data into your own systems, integrated into your own systems. And really what you're getting when you do that is you're getting a CSV file or a GeoJSON file. In this case, we're looking at a CSV file where you can see the uh, coordinate points where the measurements were made, as well as the, uh, the different dates where those measurements, when the measurements were taken, the velocity and the movement. So there's a number of ways that you can leverage this information from a very user-friendly graphical interface all the way to API and directly plugging this, uh, this, this data feed or this measurement feed into your systems so that you can manipulate it how you wish. Now with that, I'm going to hand things over uh, back over to Kevin and uh, thank you again for joining us. Thanks for that demonstration, John. We've performed independent validation of our science. Here are some of the results from a recent validation study we performed over San Jose, California. What you see on screen is essentially a comparison of GPS continuous measurements extracted from ground stations that are available within proximity of the study area from UNAVCO and the measurements that we derived using the satellite data. And you can see that there is very strong agreement in terms of the scale of the displacement and also the trend in terms of the measurements. The data that we used in this case was Terrasar X, which is strip map mode at three meter resolution. And the date range is from uh, November 2019 through to July of 2020. Just a few basic things about INSAR. So INSAR or Interferometric Synthetic Aperture Radar, it's a proven technique that leverages repeat pass satellite images over the same area to measure subtle changes in the phase portion of the signal. These phase differences, if processed correctly to remove effects due to atmosphere or topography, can reveal displacement patterns on the ground. Typically in one year, we can create a stack that includes a minimum of 30 images, which provides two measurements per month, roughly. Uh, commercial satellite sensors can be tasked to collect more frequently. The trend with new satellite missions is larger constellations, so more opportunities to collect data, which is going to result in shorter revisit times and an increase in the temporal frequency of the ANSAR-based measurements. Here at Catalyst, we apply the most suitable ANSAR technique based on the sites that are being monitored. We work closely with our clients to understand the nature of the displacement and take into account some of the operational considerations, which may include the amount of vegetation on the site, the topography, and other key factors, including what data is available. So just a few moments here to tell you about a client that has been using Catalyst Insights, PG Ventures, based in Poland. They're actually using our service to understand the potential impact of abandoned mines in uh, Eastern Europe. We've been working with them to produce the data so that they can get a better appreciation of what displacement is occurring on in, in and around uh, several areas in Eastern Europe. A little more details in terms of the features of our 
uh, displacement monitoring service. So we have the ability to make use of uh, any type of data. Uh, we're agnostic in terms of the data that we use and our workflow is adaptable. We can use open source data such as Sentinel-1, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, that gives a resolution of roughly 10 to 14 meters. It's a refresh of every 12 days and there's at least five years of historical analysis available pretty much anywhere in the world, in some cases more. The, uh, the alternative is to use commercial data in addition to uh, Sentinel-1 data. So there we can get down to really, really high resolution, in some cases sub-meter resolution. The revisit can be a lot better, seven days or shorter in, in some cases. And uh, some of the archives actually stretch back a number of years as well in those catalogs. We can typically, typically begin a project very quickly. Uh, onboarding is fairly simple. We simply gather some key information. So essentially we start with an area of interest. We then define what the settings are in terms of the expected density of the measurements, the frequency of the measurements, how often they'll be, uh, uh, they'll be needed, and also what kind of alerts to set based on your critical uh, uh, operations. Uh, so we don't we don't set the alerts ourselves. We use your information to determine what the thresholds are for the alerts. And then once uh, the monitoring is in place, the information is systematically generated. It could be consumed inside the web application, like the one that Sean showed, and also it can be uh, distributed through API access. Catalyst is a PCI Geomatics brand. Just a quick word uh, here as we close, close out the, the webinar. We have been around for a number of decades. We uh, have a number of successful clients around the world, and we have been doing this for a number of years. So really what we did uh, in this case with Catalyst Insights is take some of our best science and a, a pr address some of the key challenges that we see that need to be addressed and where there's a gap in the market in terms of providing easy access to the data derived using the satellite imagery and the science that uh, is used to produce the uh, displacement information. If you'd like to learn more about uh, this particular service and also to consult some of the maps that Sean showed, you can head to our website. We have interactive uh, demonstration where you can actually request access to some of the data that we showed today, including Washington DC in addition to Atlantic City and, and the other cities that are coming online. All right, well, thanks for that. Let me just uh, come back on screen here. Thanks for, uh, uh, for being part of this webinar so far. We are opening up the question session now, so the question and answer session. So I know a number of questions have been coming in. And uh, at this point, I'm gonna pass over to Sean, who's gonna walk us through some of the questions. And uh, yeah, really keen to hear some, some of those. Wonderful, thanks, Kevin. So if you do have uh, questions uh, still that, uh, that you'd like to ask us, please feel free to do that through the questions panel. So you can ask any of your questions here, just expand the questions panel, and then you can type your questions directly in here and we will select uh, the questions uh, that we can answer directly over the next uh, couple of minutes. And then before we close up the webinar, and if we don't get to your questions, we'll be sure to um, follow up and provide them in a Q&A session on our website. So all of the questions you ask will get answered. Um, we do have a few questions that have already come in, so uh, we'll start off with uh, Kevin. Perhaps you can just provide a little bit of background about uh, the methods, the INSAR methods uh, that we're using for computing ground displacement measurements. So you, I think you touched on it a little bit in, in one of the slides, but perhaps you can go into a little bit more detail about that. Sure. Um, so we, we do offer a number of different types of methods to process data to derive displacement information. Um, you know they were they were up on the screen pretty quickly there in the presentation. We you know we didn't we didn't focus too much on the technical details on how we do that. But uh, as I mentioned in the presentation, depending on the site and uh, what um, you know what the characteristics of that site are, we will choose the, the a method. Um, some of some of the suitability uh, will vary. So for example, if um, if we're looking to uh, collect uh, displacement data over an urban area. 
um, we will most likely use a PS INSAR technique because that will give us um, consistent measurement over hard structures like buildings and uh, those types of features. So we can collect not only the consistent features, but we can also measure the displacement of those features over time. Um, that technique tends to not be as useful for other types of applications like mine sites, uh, which, which have a lot of changes by their nature. There's uh, uh, stockpiles appearing, uh, reducing in size and so on. So really in that kind of situation, we prefer to use uh, differential INSAR. Um, and then the other thing that was mentioned in there is a short baseline uh, interferometry, SBAS. So that is a technique that we will use as well, um, depending on uh, the particulars of, of the site. So really we have like a number of techniques available. They're uh, all implemented within our software and we will deploy the best approach to solve the problem for particulars of the site. Wonderful. And one of the other uh, questions that I think came in before you got to the slide, so this might've already been addressed was, the, uh, what satellite sensor do we use for measuring the ground displacement? And I know you talked about uh, us being sensor agnostic, but perhaps you can just expand on that. Yeah, for sure. So the, you know, the amazing thing is uh, that the European uh, government, I guess, the European Space Agency um, has uh, gifted the world with access to Sentinel-1 imagery, which has really been a, an amazing mission. Uh, Copernicus program out of the European Space Agency has uh, launched and operated and systematically processed and made available openly um, raw Sentinel-1 imagery. That's what we use. That's what a lot of people use to get a general understanding of what the displacement is. The you know the the real benefit of that system is the fact that they have a standard coverage. So they are systematically collecting data at a minimum every 12 days for any land area in the world. Uh, we uh, we do have uh, support for many other sensors as well. I mentioned some of them in the case study that we did. Terrasar X is an excellent sensor from Airbus Defense and Space. Um, you can get down to one meter resolution in spotlight mode, uh, which can be really, really useful for um, infrastructure projects like uh, hydroelectric dams that tend to have uh, walls that are a little bit uh, or uh, embankments that are smaller in size so you can't see those on Sentinel-1 necessarily very well but if you use commercial data like Terrasar that can be uh, quite beneficial. Another satellite that we can use is Cosmos SkyMed. Um, you know we, 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 we can use any of the sensors but of course some of the key considerations for which sensor we will use first and foremost is availability of that data over the site. So um, the standard coverage from Sentinel-1 is available pretty much anywhere in the world. So it's nice, you can pull it up, you can process data, you can get an understanding. Um, some of the commercial data, you, uh, you may or may not have data available in the archive. So we would have to task the satellite and then start to collect a series of images. And sometimes a number of months can go by before we have enough data to produce the displacement information. So anyway, I, I could talk a lot about all the different satellites, but uh, those are the main ones anyway. Wonderful. Uh, so we have time for probably two more questions. So uh, one of those questions come in as, um, if I have measured displacements collected by differential GPS, how can I do, or what can I do to incorporate this data into the, into the processing in order to ensure high quality results? Absolutely. So we have the ability to, um, integrate those in situ measurements with the estimation of displacement. So they can be used as, uh, they can be used in two ways. They could be used as calibration points. So we can, we can use those to calibrate our estimates of displacements, or they could be used as independent verification points um, as well. So that, that is uh, quite easy to do. We have that functionality within our processing workflow to basically make use of either stable areas, known stable areas as calibration points, uh, or um, continuous uh, uh, data that's available within the area of interest from, thing, from sources such as GPS or, or ground leveling or other instruments. Wonderful, and I think this will have to be our last question as we're at time, but um, this comes in as, uh, 
one of the slides we showcased where we were able to demonstrate accuracy where we achieved uh, better than four millimeters uh, accuracy compared to the GPS UNAPCO station. Um, what is the accuracy of INSAR if we are using C-band data? So I think that's an important topic and just how, um, what, what's the best way to, to consider this, Kevin? Yeah, it's it's a great question, and I think it's a as you say, Sean, it's a it's a very important topic to address. Um, you know, I think that INSAR from satellite from satellite data provides a number of benefits, including you know vast area coverage, uh, routine monitoring without having to be on the ground, and and those benefits. Uh, should really be considered as complementary to in situ measurements. So, you know, if the decision process is what is the accuracy of the satellite based measurements versus the ground leveling, if that's the sole criteria for going forward with this technology, um, I think that that doesn't really give you a full answer in terms of evaluating this technology. So, under ideal circumstances, which is, you know, what we showed, uh, an arid site in California where we get consistent data, good baselines, good quality measurement, we can get very good accuracy. The reality is, you know, the world isn't perfect. <laughs> you have sites that have vegetation, you have sites that uh, have fast moving areas. There's a lot of key considerations that need to be taken into place. So I think when you're looking at comparing the accuracy of the satellite based measurements to in situ, really they're meant to complement each other and provide a, a more holistic picture as to what's happening. And you can think of the think of how many in situ sensors you would have to deploy to get the same type of information. Uh, that, that would just be uh, astronomically expensive. Um, rather than do that, what you can do is you can use the satellite based measurements to kind of tip and cue where to put more frequent monitoring or higher resolution monitoring uh, in the trouble spots that are being identified from, from the satellite-based monitoring. Wonderful. And I think uh, that also helps address one of the other aspects of, in terms of the complementary uh, concept between using in situ measurements and, and INSAR and uh, where INSAR can really be used to help fill in some of the no data gaps that you have with, uh, with the in situ measurements and instruments. All right, well, with that, I, I would just like to uh, thank everyone. Kevin, thank you so much for hosting this webinar. Thank you everyone for attending. And um, we, there was a number of other questions that came in. We weren't able to address them here. We're at time, but uh, we'll be sure to post the answers on our website and we'll email everyone to let, let you know when the recording is available and when the answers are, are posted to all the questions. All right. Thanks, thanks everyone. Again. Thanks, John.